a strike that is supposed to take effect from the 10th of this month. That deadline or ultimatum given to the president and the government will expire on Thursday, October 10, 2024. But in the midst of that, people are still asking questions as to whether or not the current government is not buying time by even meeting organized labor to, uh, as it were, given more time. Again, others are also questioning whether or not at this time we're just two months to the country's general election, the opposition NDC is also not taking advantage of the current situation and capitalizing on it just so it could win votes for ahead or in the December 7 general election. Hello, good evening. My name is Beatrice Edu and you're welcome to Agenda. Tonight, we're looking at the politics of illegal mining and we'll be delving into it and why we are where we are and what we need to do to ensure that something concrete is done ahead of the December 7 general election. I do have on the panel with me on my right side is Kena Shigbe. Kena Shigbe is the convener of the media coalition against uh, Galamse. Thank you so much. Good evening to you, sir. Thank, thank you for joining th thank us. Thank you very much for having me. I also do have on my left side uh, Richard Kofi Apenu. Uh, he is a former director at the Minerals Commission. He was in charge of policy planning and evaluation. Good evening to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much for having me. We do have a video call as well, Kofi Bento. He's senior vice president, Imani Africa. If you can hear us, Mr. Bento, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us as well. Good evening, B, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, good evening to Ken and the other gentlemen there. Indeed. And let me just give you some facts even before we go into the conversation. I just told you that organized labor met the president last week and talked about, well, the president wanted to meet organized labor and at that meeting demanded that the government is given some time to find, as it were, a holistic approach towards dealing with illegal mining. At that meeting, organized labor declared that strike that I just told you about, which uh, the, the members say that they will embark on from Thursday. Again, organized labor decided to have another meeting today to firm up on the decision as to whether or not to embark on the strike. And at today's meeting, uh, the leadership of organized labor said that it was going ahead with a strike if it doesn't hear anything from the presidency before the 10th of this month. And it said that it was not satisfied with the response that the presidency gave the leadership when uh, members met uh, the, them. And I'll just go through it very briefly to you. That response that organized labor says it's unhappy with, the reason it decided today it will proceed with this strike that it has declared from the 10th of this month. And there was a, a statement issued by the Minister of Employment and Labor Relations. I will just take you through a bit of it. It says that government will collaborate with organized labor and other stakeholders in the fight against illegal mining. Also, that the government will take steps when Parliament reconvenes this month to revoke the Environmental Protection, that's Mining in Forest Reserves Regulation 2023, LI 2462. The statement also said that the Attorney General will collaborate with the Chief Justice to set up courts dedicated to the prosecution of illegal mining, and the Attorney General will collaborate with the Chief Justice to also ensure swift adjudic adjudication of illegal mining. And then the last point that the government gave in that statement, government supports the call for all presidential candidates to sign uh, a pact committing to the fight against illegal mining. Mind you that there were two major things that organized labor asked for, that the presidency and the government declares a state of emergency. We've heard the land minister say that that is too draconian, <coughs> and this didn't also declare that it was going to declare a state of emergency. Organized labor also asked for a ban on all forms of small-scale mining, just so we are able to uh, deal with the situation. And we'll go into the statistics, even regarding how many licenses have been issued since, uh, let's say, 2016, 2017, up to now. But let's get the conversation going. And I'll start with you, Mr. Penu. We just talked about the politics of this very issue we're dealing with. We've had a number of government reps saying that 
on and off record that the timing for this fight is wrong because we are looking at winning an election and we are looking at getting more seats after it lost a number of seats ahead of the 2020 general election. How do you think politics has brought us where we are in this fight? Well, uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. Um, I think that clearly, if government were actually committed to this fight, this fight should have been started way back in 2017, when, when they took over. There were a lot of things that were in place at the time. For example, we had you know, an artisanal and on what, small scale mining framework, which was developed through broad stakeholder and nationwide consultation. And the purpose for this was to ensure that the you know, um, you know, artisanal and the small scale mining sector was self you know, regulatory. And that, is, and that is to say that the associations that had been set up would be the you know, vanguard of this you know, um, you know, effort to stem this you know, illegal mining activity. But I think that clearly there has been a total failure, there has been a total policy failure in trying to ensure that you know, illegal mining is eradicated from our, you know, above. How do you society. mean by total failure well, of policy? Well, you can see the, you know, surge in the, you know, debility levels of the water bodies that we have. Nobody has any legal right to go into the water bodies and to even do any such mining activity. And so how do we get here? It is purely, it is purely a matter of policy failure. Government had not been able to ensure that those who are doing this in the full glare of the you know, public have been let off the hook over, over, over the years. So I, fact, especially, you know, if you look at the 2017 till now, when, when the change of government in 2017, a ban was imposed on all forms of you know, small-scale mining, including those who had... Uh, you know, land licenses at a time to, you know, mine. What did we see? In 2017, this ban was, was imposed, which was enforced until way back in 2019, thereabout. But I can say on authority that small gold, gold production from the, from the small-scale mining sector, at the time the ban was enforced, rose from 1.42 million ounces to 2.13 million ounces when the ban was enforced. So how did it happen? Somebody must answer for this. So I'll come back to you on some of the policies you have identified. Because I remember when we spoke even prior to this conversation, you talked about being part of the brain behind the formation of Minerals Commission, for instance. And so we'll go into some of the policies you claim, those that have worked and those you think the government has been unable to implement well to deal with the current issue. But I'm coming to you, Mr. Shigbe. Um, he just said that there's been a total policy failure. I know you've been on this campaign for a long time as well. Just tell us really, from your perspective, how you think the, the, the politics in this business has really impacted us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, my colleague talks about policy failure, but looks at it only from 2017. The reason why the, um, the media coalition against Galamsey was formed was because as we were approaching 2016, the turbidity of the water got very, very bad. So that early 2017, uh, January, February, you started having the media starting to complain because the turbidity had gotten very bad. So the issues about the policy, if it's really policy failure, then the policy failure, you know, has continued for a very long time. But when you talk about the partisan politics, it is the, the elephant in the room. Let me give you a typical example. In 2016, when the current president was the uh, presidential candidate for the opposition, he was in Obwasi talking about the fact that when he comes, it's not true that when he comes into government, he was going to ban Galamse. So that when we started the fight, you had people playing those voices against him. This is 2017, uh, 2016. Then fast forward to 2020. There was Kweku Bwain, an NDC uh, communication, a deputy communication executive, standing in the theater of actually a crime being committed. 
and saying that they should go and vote. You know, the, uh, the 7th of January, they should come back and come and continue their fight. Then you move. So then as uh, uh, Operation Vanga 2017, all of that started and the work was starting. As we we're getting close to the election, you saw that because of the activity of the opposition then, you saw Operation Vanga, they withdrew the military from the Operation Vanga. You know, they became only the police. And so then the fight itself then was not wholehearted because of the partisanship that had uh, gotten into it. And the MPP will be telling you that they lost seats because of that. That even needs to be interrogated further. But now come fast forward to 2024. You saw an MPP presidential candidate in the presence of the Western Regional Minister, uh, you know, meeting these Galamsias and telling them that they were forming a WhatsApp group. And when, uh, you know, uh, these people come attacking them, the minister was also going to be on WhatsApp group. They should report it. Then you had the, uh, the former president, uh, His Excellency John Mama, talk about the fact that when he comes into office, he was going to grant amnesty to those who have been arrested, mm. you know, for the Galamse. Then you had the MP, an MPP member of parliament who is a doctor. Also talk about the fact that, you know, when uh, they are not going to stop the Galamse. Doctor, are you afraid? That's exactly. a recent video. Exactly. So you see... The partisanship has been the reason why this thing has failed. And again, let me, I mean, I like to use examples. You remember the Speaker of Parliament was in Parliament telling his parliamentarians that the, some of them were involved in Galamse. Both parties have, uh, how do you call it, Galamse funds either directly or indirectly funding them. And it's the reason why we are not able to deal with it. Again, we had the NDC and MPP have almost equal number of seats in Parliament. But LI 2462 went through Parliament 21 days and it was passed. So till we take out the issue of the partisanship out of this fight and realize the fact that as a country, we're dealing with a canker that is of genocidal proportions and we need to deal with it together, we would really not be able to win this fight. So for us, the media coalition against Galamse by extension, the Ghana coalition against Galamse, we're not going to get, we're not going to allow any part, uh, political party to take advantage of this fight. We're not going to allow the situation where they come into the big cities and they won't come and say, oh, you are not fighting Galamse. But then they will go in there and then be saying other things. We all need to coalesce against this particular crime that is being waged against us, where people are dying, where renal diseases are on the increase, and find ways in which all of us would say that enough is enough. Whatever things we need to do before we are even able to reset, we need to start saying to ourselves that, you know, you need to stop. So that's why you look into uh, the, the statement issued by uh, the Ministry of Information. And all you see in it is well, well wood. There's nothing about what has been done. Mm. And that's also missing in there is the state of emergency. Because you see, what you, and you remember what happened to us when COVID hit. We saw it as a crisis, so that the president immediately told all of us, you know, a, a shutdown was done in uh, the, the Accra, uh, you know, in the Kumasi areas. We're told to stay indoors because we realized the fact that, you know, our lives were at risk. And currently, that's what is happening with this Galam Safer. So, it for you, we shouldn't be surprised that we are uh, having this kind of like a daisical attitude from both parties. Uh, as regards to dealing with the issue. Correct. You go back and look again at their manifestos. So you take most manifestos, and they all seem to be just trying to, you know, replicate those who are involved in it and talk about things that they will do. Some have a lot of interesting things. But the thing that will halt this and let us reset is absent. I'm coming to you, Mr. Bento, and I will return to my panelists in studio here. I know you've also been speaking about this illegal mining issue for some time now, even way ahead of the last election going into this year's general election as well. I do not think that you disagree with the points from uh, Ms. Apenu and, and, and uh, Ms. Ashigbe that indeed the intensity of the political involvement in this is what is driving or has brought us where we are. Yeah, I agree more especially with Ken. Um, the first gentleman, so Mr. Peño was saying that it's a failure of the policy. Truth is that it's a failure of the enforcement or the implementation. 
I, however, like the way Ken is approaching this because people are forcing this into electoral politics. And I like to differentiate between politics generally and electoral politics, where electoral politics is short-term politics, all right? When the matter becomes as serious as the Galamsey crisis has become, it is a political issue. But we cheat ourselves when we make it a subject for electoral politics and pretend that, oh, this government is not good, so let's push them out and bring back, you know, the previous government. The previous government was not good either. And we remember how it was, and we pushed them back. And I have made the point that Galancé gets worse over time. So the government that was not able to solve it when it was not as bad as it is now should not be the one that we bring back to solve it when it's worse today. But the point that Ken makes, which is very important, is that we should lift this Galamse fight from the electoral politicking because it doesn't help us. And now let's focus on how we are going to deal with this because politicians go, politicians come, the matter is getting worse. What I would add is that we tend to sometimes look at our leaders as the solution to the problem, and so we are appealing to them to do something. We tend to assume that the politics and the play or the interplay of adversarial politics okay, is going to lead to a situation where one person is going to solve the problem that the other person did not solve. Um, like you said, we've been at this thing for a while, and I have come to a certain conclusion. The politicians are the problem. They are not the solution to the problem. They are the problem. If you go into the Galanze thing, and you know it as Ken knows it, out of every hundred, the majority are politicians or politically related persons. And a lot of the Galanze funds are going into political parties. So we need to now start thinking differently from where we think the politicians will be the solution or politics can lead to a solution to now realizing that they are the problem. And we need to figure out a way out of that kind of quagmire where these politicians are playing us and then we shift one and bring the other one and they don't solve the problem. So indeed, we need to find a new solution and also add the politicians as part of the problem and figure out a way to deal with all of them. And perhaps figure out the way, we'll look into the way because now the stance of organized labor is that we need to get answers now because if we don't and the elections are over, we may come back to square one. And I just want to give you some extra details and I'll come to you again, uh, Mr. Apenu, uh, Apenu, because uh, between 1995 uh, 19, and 2016, we realized that the issuance of licenses have gone up or has gone up. In fact, you have 57% between 1995 and 2016. And then 19, uh, 2017 till now, it's also gone up again. And I want to give you some, you know, I'm just breaking it down for you. In 2009, Mr. Shigbe, you talked about the fact that we shouldn't start the conversation from 2017, but way back, which is why we are where we are. I, I will address that. And you will address that indeed when I come to you. 2009, as you can see on your screens, uh, three licenses issued the same in 2010. Uh, it went up to four in 2011, went out to seven in uh, 2012, which was an election year, and also went up, uh, reduced to five in 2013. Now, if you move on to 2018, which is when the NPP government won the election, we had about 16, so that doubled, it went up. 2019, which was just a year to the 2020 general election, we had about 84 licenses. Uh, issued. And then 2020, we had 780 licenses, as you can see on your screens. 43 in 2021, 185 in 2022. Just giving you the last bit before I come to the panel in studio here, 2023, 240. 2024, so far, I mean, we are in October, we've issued 150 licenses. And already we have an average of 1,503, and we do understand that even this month alone, there have been some issuance of licenses, uh, at least uh, around 11. And so as we even talk about this fight, <laughs> more licenses are being issued. I'm coming to you, Mr. Penu, yes. because uh, some of the points you made have been contested, which include even the time of starting 
the accountability, as it were, of, mm. of people in authority. Right. And also when you claim that policies mm. have failed, which mm. policies precisely because mm. Operation Vanguard was there, Operation Halt 1 and 2, and the government came out to say that uh, they had positive results. Not at all. Look, it's, let me back, back talk a bit. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that proud to, you know, uh, in fact, we have had a national dialogue on what you know, small-scale money in this country before. And these were to look at the issues that pertain to the small-scale money sector and how we could address them. This is not the first time that we had, you know, uh, no operation Gallam Stop or whatever. They had, uh, they had assisted under the previous, you know, regime. But when we realized that, look, that was not the way to go, we called for, like, there was a national dialogue which was to look at the issues and how they could address them in a more holistic manner. And that also led to the you know, development of the artisanal and small-scale money framework, which was developed not by people sitting in the corner somewhere, but through nationwide you know, consultation. Now, when that framework was put in place, and that was to address this issue or this canker that we have, have, that we have on our hand, and it was to make, to ensure that the system, you know, self, you know, regulate itself by making use of the artisanal and the small scale miners that are on the ground. You, I mean, you, you, you don't, you know, because, you know, pre because the commission realized that, you know, previously all the attempts of using the forces had failed. Indeed, people who had their money equipment, politicians who had their money equipment burnt in the previous regime, because they were carrying out illegal money. When so you say the, previous regime, you mean the NDC administration? Well, I mean, that was before the, the, the 2017, where we now have the, have the community mining. In fact, people don't ask, in fact, people should ask themselves, what is that? What is community mining? Is, is it grounded in law? If it's grounded in law, show us which law talks about community mining. There is a framework that, there is a legal framework that governs how small scale money should be carried out in this country. And then, you know, fast forward in 2017, we now have you know, something called community mining and also created a what, oversight, you know, maybe a, a community mining oversight committee. And that which law? And, you know, who says that if I, under the existing law, if a small scale mining cannot take place in, you know, communities? You don't need to be based in the community to, you know, but to undertake what small scale money in this, you know, you know, sense. But we have here we are. We have got a system created called what community mining scheme, which is not grounded in law. And then it said that it but it's to help regulate the illegality it, it, of activities. Has, has 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 it achieved it? Ask yourself. Has it achieved it? We've seen worse situations where, you know, has it achieved it? That's the question you should ask yourself. Why should we be here where we are now? When there's a legal framework, and look, under the law, under the, you know, Act you know, 703, it talks about the recent mining community that has to regulate this at the local level. And then we come up with, a, you know, something called, you know, community mining scheme, and then create a parallel, you know, regulatory structure called, and give them certain powers called the community, what, mining oversight committee and all that. These are some of the issues that we should be interrogating. And it is because the politicians have virtually if you treated the, uh, how do you call it, some of the regulatory, or, or sorry, not, not some, they have infiltrated the regulatory institutions, they are not able to even carry out their, their you know, legal mandate for which they were established. I'll come to you, Kanashigbe, but I want to get a quick thought on what uh, Mr. Penu just said from Kofi Bento. You're a lawyer, and he's just talking about community mining and not having any law backing it and all of that. I'm wondering what you make of what he's just saying. Right. So, um, you know, we tend to give law more power than it really has. It is not about having law backing it. Look, I agree with him when he says that there's some in incoherence in the lawmaking and in the policies and a couple of things which tend to, you know, knock, you know, themselves off. So if, if essentially things are not effective, you have a situation where there are powerful people who are the interests, okay, who want to do the mining, and they have their wings in different places. Now, if we pretend that making law, passing laws, setting up committees is going to solve the problem. I remember when the president set up a committee at the Jubilee House, some of the interministerial, some of the, and 
the comment I made, and I made it on air, was that this committee was going to become a facilitator of illegal mining. And at the end of the day, a number of members of that committee were indicted, you know, for all kinds of problems regarding illegal mining. Sometimes we do things to represent things. We don't really want to solve the problem. We do something to represent the solution. And then we just proceed and do what we want to do anyway. So I agree with him that, you know, the laws are not working. Some of the policies are incoherent. Some of the committees, you know, seem to be working at loggerheads with each other. But I think the central problem is that we are not facing the issue squarely and making the decisions and taking the actions that we need to take. We are doing things to represent things, pass a law and then go to sleep and expect or hope that the law is going to, you know, uh, be effective by itself. I have a proposal, okay, which includes also repealing all those laws because they failed. One of the central tenets of law reform is that when a law clearly has failed, there is no more reason to keep it on the books. So the law clearly has failed. It is a catastrophic failure. That's why we have what we have. We need to clear all those laws and then sit down and figure out something not because we want to make laws, but something which is about how do we have a certain set of outcomes and then what will enable those outcomes? If a law will do that, let's do it. But let's not pass laws for the sake of passing laws. Let's not pass laws for the sake of passing laws. So repeal and bring which laws? That's something that we certainly will have to go into when we come back. But you're still here on Agenda on TV3. Uh, we are talking about the politics of illegal mining and why the serious politicking of this issue has brought us where we are, both parties that have been in power, and why there seems to be this lethargic attitude, as it were, uh, towards dealing with the matter. I have in the studio with me uh, Richard Kofi Apenu, He's a former director at the Minerals Commission uh, in charge of policy and evaluation, policy planning and evaluation at the time he was there. I also do have with me Ken Ashigbe, who is a convener of the Media Coalition Against Galamse. We have Kofi Bento, who has joined us via video call. When we come back, we'll go into the repealing of the laws Kofi Bento talks about and really some of the practical solutions we need ahead of the December 7th general election. Don't go away. Uh, we're discussing the politics of illegal mining and I want to go very swiftly to Richard Apenu who uh, is also challenging some of the points made by Kofi Bento. But before you even make your point, Mr. Penu, when the NDC was in power, you granted an interview where you said that illegal mining, banning illegal mining, as we are calling for now, will not be the solution to the menace. We don't seem to be getting the same re reaction from you. Well, no. I, I mean, I had said that banning, you know, small-scale mining would not be the solution to the problem. The reason being that there are people who are doing what illegally, and there are people who are doing what legally. There are very good examples of small scale money practices in this country. I can mention some of the names of the companies that are doing it legally and not causing any environmental, you know, um, you know, pol the damage or pollution that we are talking about. But are about. you aware that those but companies uh, also lease their license no. to illegal miners who end up polluting our environment? No, see, the, the, the point is let's get it very clearly. For the fact that some, somebody is doing something illegally, and I'm doing that, doing that same thing you know, legally, I don't have to suffer the penalty for... But, but I, mean, I, agree with, I agree with you so, when it so, comes to that. Oh, because, you see, the interesting thing is that, do you know that a counter mine that was pointed out by the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, it's not a small-scale mining firm, mm -hmm. but they were involved in the Tandon Minimary Forest Reserve doing an illegality. You also realize, Heritage Imperial, who were giving a prospecting license to mine, when we had gone, the media coalition had gone to uh, EPA to go and find out whether they had a permit to mine. They were mining in there. And even when they went to court, brought a case against Erastus, they stated in court that they are mining operation. That is also not a small-scale mining firm. When you go into most of the people who are in the forest reserves mining, none of them are the small-scale miners. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to make that distinction that there are small-scale miners who are mining very responsibly, and there are even large-scale miners, some of them also mining. So the illegality has nothing to do with the scale. It just has to do with people who are not doing the right things. Some of them have been given licenses. They then give the license to people, or they are not mining at the right places that they are supposed to be mining. So I think 
think when we start making the conversation, it is very important to really separate small-scale mining from the illegality, and the illegality straddles all the, the sectors. That's very, very important. So we shouldn't ban small-scale mining, that's what you're saying. So I'm saying, I'm saying so if you go back again, read what the, uh, the, the, the media coalition said, read what um, uh, TUC also said. They talked about banning every mine. You see, you, for the water bodies and the buffers, there's no ban because it's an illegality. So mm -hmm. it's just enforcing the laws that we refuse to, to do. It is in the forest reserves that the acts that you buy all sorts of mining, both legal and illegal, in the in the, the forest reserve. So if you are if you're a small scale miner in the small uh, in the forest reserve, that is where the call is for you to be banned. But on the water bodies and the buffers, that one, and then also you have the situation where some mining concessions almost cross the buffers, and so that definitely has to be revoked. So those licenses have to be revoked. But if you are a small-scale miner and you're not mining close to any water, you are, you, unless you want to go the El Salvador way, where we then say that all mining, so then it will not be only small-scale, it will be every mining has to stop. Have to be revoked, but at this stage, we haven't seen any action or any posture, as it were, that gives the assurance that they are going to revoke any license, whether legal or illegal. But that's, that's the pain, and it's the reason why you see that Organized labor then would say that they would go ahead. Because when you read that statement that has been issued by the Ministry of Information, and all of it is present tense. Everything is present. There's nothing that it would have... Because consider the fact that the media coalition, all of those people that had written, uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences wrote almost last year, asking for some actions to be taken. All we are hearing is well, well, well. Some of them are even the things that we've done that have brought us to 14,000 NTUs. So definitely, the president is not showing us that any action will be taken. Typically, let me give you an example of LI-2462. The president could, you know, parliament could sit, actually sit virtually. The new standing orders gives parliament the opportunity to sit virtually. So they don't need to even reconvene. But again, parliament convened when there was some, uh, what do you call it? Was it some tax exemptions? That one they came. But the situation where we are dying, the situation where we are being poisoned, was saying that as a state will not. The issue about uh, forming, uh, the, you know, being able to deal with the situation. And then we are told that enforcement are going to be done. The last two weeks, I went to uh, Nkoko. This was after the, you know, this committee had been set up and we were told that, you know, the regional ministers were going to get in charge. Sitting in my car on the road between Enyinim and Nkoko, there were, uh, you know, galamsias that you could see from the road. You've seen the Minerals Commission uh, CEO talk about the fact that right behind Enyinim, you know, Galamsia is taking place. But so, he's still issuing license. Uh, well, I watched him at the, at the Assurances Committee earlier today. He mm. still talked about issuing licenses. Yes, so again, so me, I'm, all I'm saying is that, yes, the issue about the number of licenses, and I've had them, so maybe John might be some of the people who say it. They say that, because in the past, there was a complaint also about this from the small-scale miners who said that, uh, you know, uh, they had licenses that had not been signed by the minister and all of that. And I'm hearing the argument being said that, ah, if we don't give the licenses, they'll go. But the question I also will ask the Minerals Commissioner, do you have the capacity to regulate the number of licenses that you have given? Because if you give the license, and you see, mining is a, such a very heavy technical job that has a lot of risk. So if you issue the licenses, you need to then have the capacity to manage everyone. But, you, you know, again, this, uh, so again, this is the same in Royal Commission. Said that they were going to do this tracking of uh, excavators and all of that. These, the pilots have been done. The, it's worked very well. You ask yourself, why is it that up to today? This has not been rolled out fully. That was the question that Frimpo and Boateng asked in his report. Exactly. Because if you do, then we'll be able to tell where those excavators are, Joe fence where they are. And you ask yourself, who are the people importing all of these excavators into this country? It is not our young people who are being arrested, who are in the, in the, in the jails and all of that. Too. It's the rich people who are behind us, and we can find them. Yeah. Because once you do that, you know, you get the VIN numbers. So once he moves out, you'll be able to tell who imported it, who registered it, and all of that. And there's supposed to be a collaboration between the uh, Minerals Commission and the DVLA to ensure that all of those vehicles will properly be registered. And we have a solution in place. But that's not hard to do. At all. We have a solution yeah. in place. Well, well, like I said, you know, those were some of the, you know, even this you know, tracking thing that you are talking about. 
those were some of the policy documents which had been prepared, you know, way back before this, you know, you know, uh, no, this particular era in which we are now, including, including, you know, it's only kind of that we have a you know, small scale and then a large, you know, you know, scale. We even came up with a position that we look, we need to recategorize what mining in this country. We need to have artisanal mining, you know, small scale mining, and then maybe have a mid tier, a medium scale mining, and then the large, you know, scale, you know, play, players. And then we can then be able to you look. Know, if you see some of the mining that goes on now, you can call those things small, 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 small. No, those are not small scale mining activities. No. Those those are medium scale operations, mm. and they need to be you know regulated in a certain manner. And the thing is that we need to have the the political will to be able to get this this measure done. Did you see the laws? Sorry, the laws. We have enough laws on yes, our yes, cities books. If, if you ask me. The reason we look, if you look at the current, you know, I remember to the, you know, um, um, in fact, Minas and Miami at, you know, at uh, 995. Yes, at 995. It provides for very stiff, you know, you know, penalties. Yes. It does. 15 yes. years. 15 years to, yes. 20, to even, even for a non, yes. non, non Ghanaian, Ghanaian, up to 20, 25 years yes. in certain ins, instances, yes. including those who even manufacture yes. those, you know, Chum equipment, funds. those, yes. those, the even transport, floating, even those, flat, yes, those floating barges. Yes, and when they transport, yes. if you aid and then you are bad, yes. you are also, you know, yes. so the law is absolutely there. The question, therefore, is that why is that and these are equipment that are you know transported in the full glare of everybody including the police we have several police checkpoints on the way and they go right into the forest look there are instances where and i, I just told you of an example where you know you know somebody uh, one of the politicians i don't mention him whose equipment were, were actually burnt and he had the audacity to go to court and sue government claiming Million, what, millions of dollars. These are the real. So, and you know, think that because the powers that be probably would, you know, support him. I'll come to you very shortly, Mr. Bento, but I just want to uh, get clarity from what you said. Did you say that before the current administration, there were documents and Absolutely. policies you were working on? Absolutely. Were some of them done? Well, Z, and Z, when you actually politicize things... No, I'm not no, politicizing no, 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 it. No, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not you. I'm, I'm not saying you as a person, mm -hmm. but as a country, if you tend to politicize things, this is where we would get, get to. That's fantastic. Now, I had mentioned the mm -hmm. artisanal and what, small scale mining framework, which was in place, and this was a document which was to self regulate the, the industry and to, and to do away with this scale I'm stopping, which we are a total failure. I'm actually. And now, and now I'm, I'm, I'm just coming, if you mean. I'm not done with my question. Me. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so what I was asking was I just wanted to be sure that those documents were ready for implementation. Absolutely, they were in place. So I want to assume that when Kofor left the power, I mean, when Kufour left power in 2008, when uh, Rawlings, uh, uh, Mr. Mills came in, Professor Mills came in, right. after which, uh, unfortunately, after his demise, uh, the former president, John Mahama, had to uh, take the reins of power. Right. You were at the Minerals Commission I at the time. I was at the Minerals Commission. So why wasn't this implemented? Wait a minute. See, we got our, you know, small scale, sorry, we, we had our um, uh, money policy developed in 2012. And that was the first time we ever had such a document, which was a comprehensive document developed for this country in, a, in, what, in 2012. And, then by the, and by 2016, we have got the artisanal and small scale mining framework document prepared. We had the, you know, uh, ref, the you know, documents which look at the reforms that to deal with for, you know, small scale mining, including the categorization of, of what, mining in Ghana to make sure that we had the artisanal you know, uh, you know, the you know, small scale and then the medium scale and the large scale. These documents were, were, were in place, including the tracking. That we Why were about. they not implemented? This were done somewhere in 2016. And then by, by the 2020, 20, 2017, there was a change of government. And when but actually, between 2012 oh, okay, when I, it was no, prepared no, no, and no, no, 2012 was the money, was the what? It was the, it was the minerals and money policy of Ghana, mm. right? It's quite different from these documents that, that I'm writing, but these are all policy documents which were developed, which had to be implemented. And then came, and then came 20, 2017, the then minister that took over, took the documents, 
and you know, don't talk about the multilateral, whatever minister, that, which was a total, you know, failure. No, because no, they, no, no, again, please, see, please, 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 again, can I? No, 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 please, no, 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 I didn't. I was part no, 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 of I, that I didn't. I didn't. I'm not too sure sorry, you, sorry, I didn't interject when actually you were speaking. So please, can you allow me? I had been there. You know, I, I, I spent will come all my life. Please, not your point. I spent all my life in this minas and mining sector. Mm -hmm. So when I'm speaking, I know. Look, even before, do you know that you know until until nineteen until nineteen eighty six. Nobody could mine gold legally on the on the small scale in Ghana. There was no framework for it until it, until it was developed in 1986. That's when the framework for mining gold on a small scale basis was actually developed. Diamonds you could mine diamonds in this country because they had had the framework for it then. So we're talking about something that by the Mikwa before 1986, people were mining gold illegally in this country, and Togo was in that they were being shipped through Togo. And then to code and then through Cote d'Ivoire. So the point is that. So the point is that when you get the governance, or maybe government is actually a continuum. Yes. All right. And so when maybe if actually uh, uh, government takes takes over, you need to look at what and not to you know justice or or ask how this thing should be implemented for the benefit of the country Let and not the, for the benefit of any particular interest. And that's the point I'm making. And you think that was done Absolutely. at the time? People who knew nothing because about before, before 2016 no, people, elections, no, 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 there were no, no, some no, illegal no, no. mining issues. I, I told you it has been there even before 1986. I just said it. That Let there me. was illegal mining even before 1986. There was no framework for gold. But them, by demons, there was a framework. But gold, you couldn't mine gold on a small scale before 1986. I'm coming to you, Mr. Bento, and then uh, I, will, I will get a brief comment from from uh, Kena Shigbe, and we'll have to wrap up this in terms of the solutions that we need ahead of December 7, because that is why organized labor says we are not listening to the proposals given us by the president. We want answers now. Kofi Bento, you just heard Ms. Apenu saying that we have failed, the laws have not worked, and we, we seem to be interested. The, the we, we, we seem to be interested only with, you know, passing the laws and and what we want to put out and not necessarily a policy document, for instance, that may be good, but for political reasons, we don't want to take it. What's your thought on that? Well, uh, he's right to the extent that we just don't <coughs> enforce our laws and we don't do what we need to do to solve problems. We just try to dance around the issue. But I think there's something also that we need to, I mean, just, I mean, hit us straight. We Ghanaians have a tendency to vastly overestimate our managerial capabilities. We, we tend to believe that we are capable of managing things, but we consistently make a mess. All right. Even if you take our economy, whenever the IMF is managing our economy and you know giving us the adult supervision, everything seems to go well. Then we go and take it up, and every time we take it up, we make a mess. If you look at this Galamse thing. We behave as if we are capable of managing the complexity of small-scale gold mining. And we are talking about medium-scale gold mining, large-scale, and all those things that have happened. We have consistently made a mess of it to the point where we are literally, actually, de destroying the country. Now, I don't know what it would take for us to appreciate that. We are not capable of running some of these things ourselves. And when you have a situation where your clear incapability is leading to catastrophic outcomes like what we are having here, where people are poisoned, you stop it. It's simple common sense. You stop it. So you want a total ban on all activities of mining? Absolutely. And somebody should... I want one argument, one, only one, why we should not ban all mining which is not large-scale and properly regulated. All. Even if there are a number of good small-scale miners, they are in the small minority. They do not justify us pretending that we can continue to manage this thing and be poisoning the whole country, all right, just for a few people. Look, excavators. We pretend we can manage excavators. We can't manage excavators. The history has shown it. The practice has shown it. The facts of the past few years have shown it. We did pilots to tag excavators. Huge things like excavators. We can manage them. All right? As far as I'm, I'm concerned, today in Ghana, an excavator is a weapon of mass environmental destruction. That's true. That's true. And must be treated like a gun. All right? We must treat them like things that are poisoning us and 
doing us damage because we can't manage them. I mean, Somebody beyond needs... beyond the provisions in uh, Menos Act that uh, Mr. Penny just referred to, the amended one, uh, 2019, what would you expect people who are uh, managers or own these things, how do you expect them to be treated now? Because you're saying that, I mean, this is like a weapon of mass destruction, environment-wise. For me, you need a permit to import an excavator. You should need a permit to import an excavator yeah, into this country. All right? You should need a permit because we know what it's doing. Look, we can talk at length. By the way, B, some of the statistics that you put up came from, you know, uh, sources that have been debunked. And I think I just sent you the information, so you may have to uh, re-educate We'll your, have to verify uh, that, yes. Yeah, verify that, because what you put out uh, has been debunked. And you can look at the website and correct them. But back to the point, look, whenever you have a catastrophic situation, the first thing that leaders do is to simplify. In our situation, the context of a catastrophic destruction or catastrophic failure is the galamse that is destroying the whole country. In simplifying it, you ban everything. We don't have the capability to make a distinction between who is right and who is wrong. When we ban everything, all right, we can start slowly and do things like license the importation of excavators and anything. Why? Who needs a chamfang in Ghana? Who needs it for any other business? Mr. Penny is shaking his head. He seems to so disagree I'm with you. About, uh, let me land on this point. We need to just agree that we don't know how to manage these things and therefore stop it and then go slowly instead of just open it up and pretend that we can manage them. And I did promise that we will have to find the solution we need or the measures we need to implement ahead of the December 7 general election so we are sure that whatever measures are there, uh, the authorities in place will be committed to enforcing it. But again, I want to believe that one of the reasons organized labor is calling for a declaration of a state of emergency is perhaps a step towards dealing with this thing that we are, we are, we are talking about. Mr. Bento, it shouldn't cost an arm and a leg to declare a state of emergency. Uh, uh, Why is the president avoiding it? Yeah. I don't know why the president is avoiding it. And indeed, it does not... It does not seem, it, it, I don't know why, because seriously, we are in a state of emergency. Yes. A state of emergency is something that the government declares, not out of the blue, but because of certain things that are happening. And if you ask me today, Ghana is in a state of emergency. And so declaring it is just doing the obvious. I don't know what it will cost the government to do it and why they are not doing it. And, and indeed, I have said, you know, I, I put a post on my Facebook that we are at a point where if organized labor giving all their power and representing a wider society, is not able to get our governments to do what is right. We are risking our whole country because people are going to take the law into their own hands and try to do what they need to do to save this country. We are already in a state of emergency. The government should declare. And I want, to, I want to ask you my last question, and I'll get the final words from my panel members here. I know in 2022, you said that the president cannot be exonerated from this illegal mining menace. Do you still believe that? The reason he doesn't seem to want to declare a state of emergency and even ask Labour for time earlier. I don't know why he will not do it. Indeed, the president has a few months to go. I don't know what the cost to, you know, uh, what the cost of this will be to him. And um, yes, I've said it publicly that I'm disappointed. The president, this president said all the right things and proceeded to do all the wrong things. Mm -hmm. I'm quite disappointed in, you know, how he's handled this thing. And I can't, for the life of me, understand why he would hold off declare a state of emergency, which is an, a fact. We are in a state of emergency. And I think if you declare it, I just don't know why he won't. I'm coming to you, Mr. Shibuya, and I'll give you the final word, Ms. Apenu. The president, in that interview with France 24, said that it is their behavior that lands them in problem with the police and the courts. That was referring to the arrest of the 53 Democracy Hub protesters. Uh, well, today the courts granted uh, 21 of them bail. We've also heard uh, Dr. Mahmoud Rubaumia, the flag bearer of the MPP, saying that he would ensure that small-scale mining happens, but in a non-destructive way. We're talking about commitment towards or ahead of the, 20, uh, the, the December 7 general election. What kind of measures do we need now to ensure that we're able to get some level of commitment ahead of the elections? Let me just disagree with Kofi first, that the fact that we cannot manage. I've, I've told you that even in, there's a pilot that has been run 
for the whole issue of the excavators and all of that. It's not for lack of management. It's the will to be able to do it. It's the fact that those who have to do it themselves find themselves complicit in it. But I think the solutions that we need to resolve these issues are properly outlined in what uh, organized labor has said, in what the media coalition has said. The government needs to, to place the state of emergency on the water bodies, the buffers of the water bodies. Because, see, uh, uh, the constitution is clear. It, it does not have to be a national one. It can be in part. So in that particular place, we definitely need to get the military, get everybody, including the local people, involved in ensuring that we stop the degradation, we stop the destruction. What is happening in the forest reserves, we deal with it. What is happening on our water bodies? Mm. If we're saying to ourselves that most of these people on these water bodies are foreigners, then if that's, it means there's attack from within. Once we get the president acting, then we get the, other, uh, the two political parties, the leading political parties, their presidential candidates, to sign on and say what the president has started doing. We also support it. Get them to say it openly so that mm. nobody goes to say anything else. Because mm. on the 8th, 7th of January, one of them would have to continue doing that because within two months, three months, you are not going to be able to solve the problem as we have now. Indeed. Let me just get in, in about 60 seconds, if you would kindly help us uh, do that. Uh, just getting your final word on really how sustained you think we should do this ahead of December 7. Well, we just cannot go on like this. Something has to be done about this. And all the first order, second order, the third order you know, streams, they need to be protected. If we stop all the, you know, pol maybe the pollutants going to the streams, we will be, you know, safe. That has to be done. There's no, there's no tomorrow for that. Exactly. We need to do that now. immediately now. And okay. there should be no compromise yes. at all and whatsoever. And now, coming, we've all been talking about the mercury, you know, pollution, mm -hmm. which goes into the environment. Look, there has been an alternative to the use of mercury developed in this country way back over eight, eight years ago, nine years ago. Why are, we, why, why, why are we using it? If we did that, we would then at law the PNDC law 217, which is the Mercury Act or law. And then once we implement that, then we don't really need for use of Mercury at all. Mm. We've signed on to the Minamata you know, Convention, and, the, and it has kicked in in, what, in 2017. We're in 2024, and we are still having Mercury on our institutions books. Why? Let's act let now. Us, let us act now. Let us use the direct smelting method, do away with mercury, at law mercury completely, and then ensure that, look, the pres the, by the country or the president has all the forces behind him. Mm. If he wants to get this thing done, the time is now. We cannot wait Thank for tomorrow. Thank you so much, Mr. Richard Kofi Apenu, for joining us on Agenda tonight. Uh, also, thank you to you, uh, Mr. Kenashigbe, for also joining us. Kofi Bento, joining us via video call. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as well. That will be it for Agenda tonight. My name is Beatrice Edu. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Join us again next week, Monday, coming up shortly. It's Ghana tonight. Stay with us.